name is Emma, and today I'll be talking about uh, misleading medical marketing, how it's amplified through social media, what we might do to counter the harmful effects, and then at the end I want to touch a little bit upon um, regulation uh, for advertisement. And I don't have any conflicts of interest besides that my travels here have been paid for by preventing overdiagnosis. So, I want to start off by posing this question. Why do people turn to social media to learn about their hormone levels or to get general health advice rather than consulting their doctors? I think some at least, some of the answers can be found in an overburdened healthcare system where clinicians are really just stretched thin to accommodate the exceeding needs of consumers and patients. And I do think consumers are rightfully worried about their health because they're constantly being bombarded about with all these uh, sometimes well-meaning disease awareness campaigns that encourage them to closely monitor their body or their bodily symptoms. And that's really where I think direct-to-consumer medicine finds its place. And these are the major three pillars that I see uh, of direct-to-consumer medicine. It's the direct accessibility of testing, the autonomy or choice to test where and when, which thus should uh, theoretically empower patients to make more informed choices about their health. But we're going to return to these. However, many tests that are advertised directly to consumers have poor test accuracy. They're marketed to consumers that or population of very low risk or even healthy populations. And sometimes they're even advertised way ahead any evidence to support both the benefits and the harms. In this scoping review by our Australian colleagues led by Dr. Patty Shee, they found that um, most tests that are advertised directly to consumers have no clinical utility. In fact, of around 500 tests, only 11 of these had potential clinical utility. And this whole thing obviously poses risk of various sorts of low-value care, including overdiagnosis, and, and what I want to speak to today is how social media is really becoming a key driver of this movement. So in this study led by the amazing Dr. Brooke Nickel, we analyzed almost a thousand tests of five popular medical tests that have high risk of harm, including overuse and overdiagnosis. And these included the gut microbiome test, full body MRI, multi-cancer early detection test, AMH, fertility test, and testosterone. And across these tests, we found that 87% of these mentioned benefits of testing, 84% directly promoted the uptake of the test, around half of them provided a link through which consumers could directly access the test, but, however, only about 15% of these mentioned any harm. And I think that's quite remarkable, thinking that we sample these posts because they have, or the tests have, high risk of harm. And 6.4% presented any evidence to support the, the claims about the benefits. And not surprisingly, 68% had a financial interest in selling or promoting the uptake of the test. So overall, what we identified was a flood of posts that kind of blurred the lines between medical advice and commercial interests, which all kind of fuels overdiagnosis. And um, in this presentation, I'd like to use testosterone testing as an example to highlight more general trends in, in direct consumer advertisement on social media. So the first post I want to show you is uh, this post from a hormonal clinic. They, um, they, in this post, they promote the uptake of the testosterone test while simultaneously listing all of the, some of the benefits from testosterone replacement therapy. It says more energy, better sex, and even a restored zest for life. And then they go on to encourage all men above the age of 30 to get tested, which is quite bold thinking that it's not grounded in any medical consensus or evidence. And what I also think is quite remarkable, or what I think you should notice here, is that the advertisement of the test is really closely linked to the advertisement of the treatment. But we'll go back to that. Another one here is a shirtless doctor but uh, he's also the CEO of a testosterone replacement telehealth clinic. 
And in, he posts various uh, videos where he's also not wearing a shirt, um, <laughs> but where he recognizes the various symptoms of uh, living with low testosterone. And um, in, this, in this post, he's using direct appeal to say that he can make your dream turn into reality. Another aspect that we noted while we coded these posts was that many of the posts that promoted the uptake of testosterone testing also appealed to masculinity. Um, one example here from Instagram is a coach with 100,000 followers that says, if you want to be an alpha, get tested. Another example from TikTok is, how am I going to build muscles like a man if I have testosterone levels like a female? And just when you thought it couldn't get worse, or maybe you didn't even want to be an alpha, or maybe you didn't even want to be hypermasculine, but if you want to keep your wife, maybe you should reconsider getting tested, because here's what an influencer on Instagram says. So what will happen is when a man's testosterone levels will drop, he'll lose his sense of drive, sense of humor, sense of self, direction in life, enthusiasm, liberty, you name it. Frankly, all of the things that made his wife love him may go away. They seek marriage counseling, but it goes nowhere because the man has some kind of biochemical problems that hamstrings his ability to be a man that a woman would naturally love. Gosh, hey? <laughs> but these are very powerful narratives, but, and they kind of um, simplify or reduce very complex human experiences into biochemical problems or hormonal deficiencies. And I think this is actually not like very new strategies to promote low testosterone. I think Lisa and, and Steven described these 20 years ago. But these are now amplified and reaching a few, much larger, larger audience through social media using exploiting algorithms and using targeted ads. But I think it's not just about um, this course. There are actually real medical harms at stake. And these include overtesting. Testosterone fluctuates throughout the day and will necessarily lead to repeat low value testing. Overdiagnosis and all of the, to us, very well-known downstream harms. Overtreatment and side effects, which in the case of testosterone replacement therapy includes major cardiovascular adverse events, male infertility, and really even the same symptoms that the treatment is set out to test to treat. And then there's medicalization of these complex human experiences, as I describe them as. And I also think it has medical, medicalizing implications for how we practice or think about gender, so for non-stereotypical masculinity identities or um, ge general gender identities. So the pillars of direct-to-consumer movement or medicine really seems to be crumbling with mixed with social media. And I think it's, these posts not only just uh, poses medical harms, they also embody very traditional gender norms, which I think are not liber liberating as otherwise promised by the direct-to-consumer movement. They're very limiting, and sometimes they're also dangerous. Am I ringing a bit, or no? Should I go over here? Okay, let me stand here a bit. So, with the very lovely team mentioned here at the bottom, we did a scoping review to kind of map what are the potential solutions to this problem of misleading medical marketing on social media? And what we found was really four major categories of responses. And if you look to the upper corner, the blue circle, um, we identified a huge range of different educational resources for teaching consumers how to recognize or identify misinformation, or including health literacy, and we also identified debunking efforts, which included um, efforts to correct or expose, expose misinformation as untrue. And what, are, what, is re what is really notable is that these two circles really targeted the consumer to either spot and reject misinformation, change behavior, boycott products, in other words, teaching consumers to be responsible. Then we also identified a few algorithmic responses, which was primarily uh, machine learning models that um, were supposed to detect misinformation and flag misinformation on platforms. And then we identified, we also searched great literature and identified a whole range of different national 
uh, advertising regulations. And just broadly overview, we found that most of them have a ban on the direct-to-consumer advertisement of drugs or pharmaceuticals, except for the US and New Zealand, which is changing next year for New Zealand. But they all allow the direct-to-consumer advertisement of medical devices. And, um, how, and with few key requirements of the advertisement to be truthful, balanced, um, the claims had to be substantiated and it could not be misleading. Uh, but there were uh, no to few uh, oversighting programs in place in the respective countries. So although we identified a range of different responses to this problem, I still see some challenges that are not fully accounted for in the current landscape. And that really is speed and reach, and I think um, even virality of the misinformation, because the way that this information just takes over what's on our phones is really a game changer, both for consumers, but also for governments, especially in the context of no oversighting programs. Then um, the political landscape, we saw how that last year affected NITA to completely remove any fact-checking on their platforms, citing concerns of free speech. And then, although I genuinely do believe that information obviously should have high-quality, trustworthy information, I also think that this approach has some limitations. And the first one is just, I think, the bare acknowledgement that consumers are up against multi-billion companies. And they have the opportunities to just, you know, create extremely sophisticated advertisement that exploits algorithm, but also um, leverages, you know, um, targeted ads, targeting individuals that they know will be susceptible to the messages that they're trying to convey. And I also think beyond just um, concerns of inequality. I think from a public health perspective, spending resources teaching consumers to be responsible in the context of tests that do not have any evidence of benefit really seems uh, a bit nonsensical to me. So is it fair to place the watchdog responsibility on the consumer? I think that relying on the capacities of the consumer to spot and reject misinformation might be a little oversimplifying of the complex problems that they're facing. And as said, I do agree that consumers should receive high quality evidence-based information, but the question is, who should be responsible that this is happening? So I wanna quickly revisit the fact that there's a ban on the direct-to-consumer advertisement of drugs, but why is a pill more tightly or strictly regulated than a test that leads you to take the pill? I think that it is most likely due to a perceived lower risk of harm of medical devices because, you know, it's really easy to track side effects from treatment, but it might be a little bit more difficult to track public health or public health implications from overdiagnosis. And also, I, but I think, I do think with the growing evidence of the harms of testing and all of the, you know, amazing work that you guys are doing on the harms of testing, we know that testing can cause harm not only to patients, but be to clinicians, to public health, as well as to the environment and to the planet, even. So I think if we kind of accept that medical devices can cause real medical harms, I think this looks, starts to look more like a case of regulatory capture, where governments are not adequately protecting their consumers from the harms of medicine. I showed you these two interesting advertisements where the advertisement of the treatment is actually really closely linked to the advertisement of the tests. So my question is that are companies just driving trucks through loopholes of regulation, advertising their treatments in disguise of testing? And to quote Dr. Abbasi, <laughs> the law may be an ass, but is it our last hope to protect health? Studies have shown that misinformation on social media is really booming, and I think that's testament to the fact that current efforts are not adequately effective. And I think it also supports that governments might revisit mandating more corporate responsibility for this issue. And I do think that 
I still want to stress one more time that in consumers should receive high quality evidence-based information, but I think that should be the bare minimum and not the goal in itself. So I have some hopes for the future, um, but I want to start off by acknowledging that I think that social media has changed the way that we access care. It has maybe even democratized the access to care, but I also think that it has distorted it in the ways that I've shown you. So I argue for three new pillars of direct-to-consumer advertisement, and that is firstly a reconsideration of the perceived lower risk of harm, a bad, a bad test may be worse than a bad medication. A reconsideration of the responsibility. I don't think that we should rely on individuals to be responsible while governments or while companies and platforms face, face few consequences. And also, I believe we need collective action. Um, we need to have a collective conversation about the blurred lines between helpful medical advice and commercial interests on the other hand. And then I think we need to make collaborative, multidisciplinary, system level interventions to combat this pro a problem instead of relying on consumers. And these should resonate with governments and uh, policy makers. So is this working? Maybe? Yeah, it is, lovely. So, for preventing the future of preventing overdiagnosis, I hope that you have been inspired to think about the role of regulation in preventing overdiagnosis or mitigating the harms of overdiagnosis. And I also hope that this has inspired you to think about the responsibility that we put on consumers in the, with the aim of preventing overdiagnosis. Thank you so much for your time.